Thank you for listening to Depictions Media Radio. Welcome to Policy and Rights, the show about government policy and human rights. We're calling for ceasefire. It's not a movie to be played to stop what we want and leave people die. A ceasefire must be called and must be called now. And this narrative of everything started only on October 7th is false. This is seven decades of struggle. So if we don't put things into context and we don't fix the root cause, will remain always in this vicious cycle and more innocent lives will be lost. We as an Arab group and with the Islamic group will continue our meetings with all different levels, with the Secretary General Office, with the PGA, with the Security Council and with the other entities. Our goal now is on those three basic issues and most importantly, nothing can be resolved without an immediate ceasefire. Thank you. Question to those of you who do have relations with Israel. Um, do any of you plan to follow Jordan's lead and recall your ambassadors or sever your relations with Israel like some countries in Latin America have done? Uh, I will leave it to so those who whoever wants to address this issue. In the meantime, while they're thinking before they respond, Pam. Thank you very much, Ambassador. What in your words, is stopping the UN Security Council from having a consensus document. And Martin Griffiths this morning told diplomats that what happened in Israel and what's happening now in the Palestinian territories is a stain on our collective conscience. Do you agree with that statement? And what's stopping the Security Council? Thank you. Uh, first of all, you know, it is, I agree, it is a stain. And also I agree with him when he addressed the Security Council about 10 days ago, along with Lazzarini and Lynn Hastings, in which the three of them agreed collectively on the need for an immediate ceasefire. We agree also with the Secretary General when he asked for a humanitarian ceasefire, whatever that means, but it is a ceasefire, in order to save lives and to allow for humanitarian assistance to get inside the, uh, the Gaza Strip. With regard to the Security Council, I think my brother Tahir uh, is, uh, uh, explained the hypocrisy and the double standard of using different sticks of measurements when it comes, for example, to Ukraine. But when it comes to the situation in the Gaza Strip, they look the other way around. They give Israel under the so-called the right to self-defense, de to, self to continue with these crimes against the Palestinian people. In fact, their proposal for pauses, it means that they are not saying that the war should stop, but keep killing, but give them few hours to allow for some humanitarian aid. We reject that. The General Assembly rejected that. And we are knocking at the door of the Security Council to implement the resolution that was adopted in the General Assembly. So the divisions and the paralysis of the Security Council for issues as the case of uh, Ukraine reflect itself in making it paralyzed and not to uh, elevate itself to the responsibility that they should uh, undertake 
called for in the Charter of the UN to maintain international peace and security, and they are not doing that. To maintain international peace and security when there is war, the first thing that they should do, cease fire, stop the war, and deal with that situation. And because they want some who have uh, veto power, want Israel to continue with this crime and to leave it completely to Israel to decide when they will stop then, therefore, the Security Council is unable to act collectively. Nevertheless, we will continue knocking on the door of the Security Council, the President of the Security Council, as we've met with him yesterday, all members of the Security Council, uh, so that the Security Council to shoulder its responsibility. But in the meantime, the General Assembly spoke while the Security Council is taking a nap and paralyzed, and we hope that the entire, the, uh, the entire international community to accumulate enough pressure so that those who are giving this license to Israel to continue killing thousands of Palestinian civilians, thousands of Palestinian children and women, and uh, having, you know, collective punishment of denying our people in the Gaza Strip of fuel for electricity, uh, denying them food, medicine, water. We listened to some representative from UNRWA and when Mr. Lazzarini, whom we salute him, as we salute the uh, Secretary General when he stood outside, you know, the Rafah gate and he made his cry, open the gate, stop uh, the uh, fighting and allow humanitarian assistance. Mr. Lazzarini went inside. Palestinian children were telling him, we don't want bread, we want water. The basic element of life is water. They were telling him, we need water in order to survive. I think humanity and the international community should listen to that call of that brave man who went inside you know, the Gaza Strip, and we were hoping that he would be reporting to us in the meeting that took place this morning. Unfortunately, he did not. But we will keep trying to invite him, maybe in an event in the General Assembly, so that he can share with all of us that massive tragedy of the Palestinian people in the Gaza Strip. So perhaps the consciousness of some that is not awakening to be awakened and to, to stop this crime against humanity, which is bordering, uh, according to many uh, uh, a humanitarian specialist in the UN system saying that it is bordering genocide. Now, with regard, if any of my colleagues you. that you ask their question wants to, to say anything, but we welcome those who are taking measures, like what happened by our Jordanian brothers, by what happened, you know, by a number of Latin American countries, by what uh, the, uh, the uh, parliament of Bahrain did uh, in this regard, and Oman in saying, denying, you know, Israeli airline from flying over their country, we encourage as many as possible to take practical steps against those who are committing crimes against the Palestinian people, and by that I mean the representative of the occupying authorities. They need to feel the pressure. Somebody in the meeting of the OIC the other day, <coughs> proposed that maybe those who export oil and gas to Israel from some of the OIC countries to consider suspending, sending them that, while they are denying our hospitals fuel to run the generators to save lives of injured Palestinians and sick Palestinians. So I believe if they do not stop this war uh, as soon as possible, we will see more of these practical steps by different countries, and we appreciate that immensely. Let everyone take whatever they can in practical sense to stop this crime against the Palestinian people in the Gaza Strip. Yes, I wish to comment on that question of, of uh, calling the ambassadors and so on. We fully respect 
the reasons behind uh, Jordan and Bahrain calling their ambassadors in Tel Aviv. But I can tell you, uh, if Egypt is maintaining uh, their ambassador and he continues to operate and to work in Tel Aviv for a reason, because we, we are brokering, we are helping, designing and having a modality whereby uh, trucks and humanitarian assistance are flowing into uh, Gaza. You need uh, people that had sufficient outreach, sufficient uh, 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 contacts and, and so on at the highest level. So uh, in the due course, if Egypt feels a, a sufficient reason to, to call our ambassador Tel Aviv, we'll, we'll do such thing. We have done it uh, historically. Be, uh, call it to it the past. Yes, yes, we have done it before. So, so uh, believe me, uh, the most important is to keep doing what we're doing, to fulfill our duty for us as Egyptians. We are at the front line uh, doing a very challenging job of coordinating with the UN officials, with the US, with uh, the Israelis and with the, the Palestinian Red Crescent and, and all the, the authorities in, in Gaza to make sure at the end of the day our Palestinian brothers and sisters will be getting the sufficient uh, humanitarian uh, aid. We're very grateful for all the countries who are, have been uh, helping and sending the planes to Larish and and very grateful for the UN for doing what is, is correct. We have been there in that uh, uh, briefing. We have thanked uh, uh, UNRWA for doing what they're doing, uh, 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 for th OCHA and everyone, o UNICEF, all of them. The Secretary General himself is doing a, a, a great job helping us, facilitating the assistance to our Palestinian brother. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. I, I, on I, how many wounded I, Palestinian have crossed to Egypt uh, today? We know uh, 81, I believe, yesterday, but do you have any updates I, for I us? I believe the Situation Room is, 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 is providing us with constant updates, as Ambassador Mansour said. Last night we have had 102 uh, trucks, we have had 400-something uh, foreigners crossing into uh, waves or so, and, and we, we are continuing the plan to evacuate the, the wounded people, to have the uniform flow of, of, of trucks and as well to help countries uh, uh, getting some of the dual nationalities, Palestinians that are holding uh, foreign passports and so on and the UN officials uh, to, to get out of, uh, 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 and to be evacuated from Gaza. Thank you very much. Well, we want to thank you very much. We will keep you informed. We will keep having these press conferences as we feel uh, necessary and uh, we want to thank you for uh, assembling, you know, in this uh, large number. But I want also to add, remember one of your colleagues, his name is Muhammad. He is a correspondent of uh, Palestinian, uh, uh, Palestine TV in Khan Yunus, I believe in, uh, in the Gaza Strip. He finished a report yesterday. He went home and his house was bombed. He was killed along with 10 or 11 members of his family. Remember him, honor him, and defend journalists because it is our duty and the duty of the international community to defend journalists as they defend also children and women and civilians uh, during the time of war. Uh, but there are your colleagues, Palestinian journalists. The last one is, you know, uh, Brother Muhammad. May God bless his soul. He was killed along with his family yesterday in the Gaza Strip. We thank you very much. Good, me uh, good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to this press conference. Or I should rather say thank you for welcoming us in your news briefing. Uh, I'm, I have the pleasure to introduce you, Ambassador Václav Balek, who is the person of the Czech Republic to the United Nations in Geneva and is speaking to you today in his capacity as President of the United Nations Human Rights Council for the year of 2023. So President Balek was in New York this week mostly to meet with uh, senior officials but also to present the yearly reports of the Human Rights Council to the General Assembly. So without further ado, I give the floor to Ambassador Balek who will then take your questions. Thank you. Ambassador. 
Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for this interaction. Uh, good morning, uh, colleagues. Uh, it's a real pleasure uh, to meet you. Uh, as you know, I'm uh, here for the second time uh, this year in my capacity of, as the president of the uh, Human Rights Council. Uh, the purpose of this visit is uh, always the same, to meet the key stakeholders uh, and to inform about the work uh, of the Council in the General Assembly, in the Third Committee uh, and uh, other players, uh, actually, which are interested and important also for our work in, in uh, Geneva. Uh, I've met the President of the General Assembly, President of the Security Council, President of the Economic and Social Council, Chair of the Peace Building Commission, the UN and government officials, and I'm meeting uh, this afternoon the UN Secretary General as well. Uh, now let me uh, seize the opportunity uh, and uh, tell you what the Council was doing uh, throughout the year. Uh, to, to a certain extent, I've uh, mentioned uh, those uh, data and those facts uh, already uh, in front of the General Assembly, but I'll repeat uh, some of those highlights I really uh, deem as important. Uh, what is important uh, is to keep in mind that uh, the, the Human Rights Council is pretty busy uh, with its agenda. Uh, it was sitting, uh, as far as the reg regular session is concerned, for 14 weeks and two days. So it's the longest uh, period uh, in the history of the Council, uh, which is not bet uh, in the end because it shows that the council is important and uh, council is being seen as the body which can deliver on uh, many issues. What is also important this year, or what was important, uh, though the year is not yet over, that we've introduced uh, some new topics into the kind of human rights uh, domain. Uh, We've discussed the uh, digital uh, media and informational uh, literacy, and we do have uh, some uh, initiatives on that. Uh, centrality of care uh, was discussed, the rights of children to, to quality and safe education, uh, and climate change was also uh, prominent. What was also uh, discussed and where we have uh, the uh, new resolution is the uh, right of uh, development uh, agenda. Again, stressing uh, the interlinkages between uh, various pillars uh, of the UN system, uh, because of course we are not uh, acting in a vacuum in Geneva. Uh, we are very much being influenced, or the Council is being uh, very much influenced by uh, what is happening uh, around us, and we need to take into uh, into the consideration what is uh, what is uh, important. Uh, for our uh, taxpayers, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, who are paying uh, for uh, all of that. Uh, let me say also uh, that uh, we've had a special session on Sudan uh, in May. Uh, I briefed you uh, already uh, during my previous visit. Uh, we've had uh, also an urgent debate on uh, religious hatred. And going back to the last year, uh, but it has happened uh, after the uh, after the presentation of my predecessor here in uh, in New York, uh, we've had a special session on Iran uh, also. Uh, so that that's uh, probably uh, important to, to mention it. Uh, we've established uh, throughout the last year uh, two new independent international investigation mechanisms, fact-finding mission on the Islamic Republic of Iran. I've mentioned the, the special session uh, held uh, last November. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, and fact-finding mission on, on Sudan. Uh, let me add that the fact-finding mission on, on Iran presented its first uh, oral update in September and will present its first report in March 2023, meaning next year. And then the fact-finding mission on Sudan will present its first oral update in June 2024, and the first rep report in September uh, 24. Uh, if you ask me actually how far uh, we are uh, as far as the selection process of uh, the members uh, of this fact-finding mission uh, on Sudan, I would respond in a way that the process is uh, taking place basically as we speak. My intention is to really nominate the, those members as soon as I'll get back uh, from uh, New York uh, to Geneva in order to allow them to work uh, uh, quickly and efficiently and soon on uh, this important uh, agenda. On uh, technical operation and capacity building, we've had uh, also a couple of uh, important 
uh, venues and uh, discussions. This year, the Council established new mandates for uh, countries seeking technical assistance and capacity building. Uh, the Council requested the High Commissioner to designate two independent experts on Haiti and Colombia, uh, and the, the Council also approved uh, support to Honduras in the reform of its prison system. And what is important for many countries uh, from Caribbean is the fact that the uh, Council also approved an establishment of the Regional Office of the High Commission for Human Rights in the uh, Caribbean uh, area, uh, exactly in the Bahamas. The Bahamas are going to host that office. What else? Uh, maybe something about the atmosphere, uh, which is pretty important, if, especially if you think about what is happening uh, around us. I do feel that we are still able to produce a good uh, results uh, as far as the work of the Council is concerned. I do feel a lot of support. I do feel a good atmosphere in the Council, a responsibility which is really important for the work uh, of the Council. Uh, I'm really, I would even dare that I really do feel to be proud president of the of the Human Rights Council, which uh, functions really well. Of course, we do have uh, some differences. We don't agree on everything. Uh, but if you think about the fact that uh, we've adopted a uh, number of resolutions altogether, like more than 100 and I think 17 texts uh, all together, uh, and uh, 70 persons, uh, 74 persons to be precise, of those texts were approved by consensus. That means quite a lot. Uh, that means that there is a uh, really a, a good will. Uh, there is a kind of a feeling of responsibility. And there is a space uh, in which we are able to really work uh, together and uh, address uh, the issues which are important uh, for all of us. HRC membership, uh, maybe let me say in passing that we will have a new 15 members, uh, or we have 15 elected members, some of them are new, some of them uh, will serve uh, the second term. Uh, they are going to start on the 1st January 2024, exactly at the date at which my uh, mandate will uh, finish and uh, the Czech Republic will be the country leaving uh, the council for, for the next year. Uh, as a matter of fact, but uh, there will be new blood, new energy uh, in the Council, I'm sure. And I'm also sure that uh, the Council next year will be as efficient and as consensual as uh, this year. Uh, I do have a really long speaking point, but uh, since uh, we are a bit uh, behind the schedule and we need to finish uh, at 12 o'clock, uh, I would maybe propose, if you would agree, to give the floor to you, questions and comments, and maybe we can have more uh, interactive uh, uh, dialogue uh, among us, uh, rather than me uh, using another 20 minutes uh, for uh, my briefing and then leaving. So if you, if you could accept that, that would be my proposal. And I see noting, so... Thank you, Ambassador Balek. Uh, Pamela Folk from CBS. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and because there's no one else from the UN Correspondents, I'll thank you on behalf of the UN Correspondents Association, and it's Pamela Falk from CBS News. A lot of people have um, voiced concern that Iran is chairing one of the committees of the Council. Um, can you speak to that? And then, of course, is the council looking both at the events of October 7th as, as possible war crimes and what's going on in the Palestinian territories, or just the latter? Thank you. Iran is not chairing uh, any of the of the human rights committees. Uh, Iran is chairing uh, or chaired uh, an event uh, yesterday and today, uh, which was established based on the resolution which was uh, adopted uh, last year by consensus uh, by the members of the Council. And the 
Iranian ambassador was the only proposed candidate uh, for that position. And if you read carefully the resolution, there is no space for any president actually to somehow question or uh, change the opinion of uh, the regional groups. And I acted uh, according to the resolution and I uh, nominated uh, the Iranian ambassador as the chair of that event. And according to the information I have uh, from Geneva, uh, there were no uh, problems whatsoever. Uh, event uh, took place and everybody actually uh, profited for, from the fact that actually uh, there was a substantial exchange of information. So uh, I don't know what I can I can act uh, I can add uh, I had no uh, other chance to really do anything else uh, and uh, since uh, there were no uh, other nominations well it was no brainer uh, for me for or for any president on uh, what is happening in the Middle East uh, you've just been briefed uh, by uh, colleagues from the OIC of course uh, the Rights Council is not uh, um, functioning in a bubble or in a, an isolation uh, of what is happening uh, around us. Uh, we've uh, had uh, a debate at the end of the last uh, council about the situation in the Middle East, but it was on, uh, what was it, 13th of uh, September, so it's, no, October, 13th of, uh, 13th of uh, October, uh, and since then there was no debate uh, in the council. Uh, whatsoever. So we are following, I think, uh, all uh, carefully what is happening here, what is happening in the General Assembly, what is happening in uh, the Security Council, and if the Council is going to be asked actually to contribute with its uh, wisdom and uh, expertise, uh, we will do so. Thank you. Uh, Margaret Bescher from Voice of America. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you for briefing. Um, I just wanted to ask you about accountability for attacks on hospitals, uh, UN premises and such in uh, Gaza that's happening uh, now. What role will the U uh, UN Human Rights Council have in finding some sort of accountability for attacks from whichever side is doing them? And uh, do you plan to have any emergency special sessions of the council on the situation in the occupied territories? Thank you for that question, but uh, as you know, I'm speaking to you in the capacity of the President of the Council, and it's not uh, up to me, actually, to decide what's going to be in decided or consulted or discussed or not discussed uh, at the Council level. Uh, so, as I've said, uh, we are following the situation. Uh, you know the mandate uh, of the Council, so if uh, the Council uh, will be asked or uh, get that uh, with a view to really provide information on uh, any particular situation which is happening around us. It's not uh, just about uh, what is happening in, in Gaza. Uh, the Council will uh, certainly uh, provide uh, its view and uh, provide its position. But as, as of now, as I said, we've had an exchange of information uh, on uh, 13th of October and since then uh, there was no debate in the Council on this particle dossier. Yes, if you could please introduce yourself. I'm sorry, I don't know all of you here in New York. Maryam Ramadi with uh, Afghanistan International News Channel. Uh, my question is regarding um, deportation of Afghan refugees from Pakistan. As you know, um, many people have been, thousands of people already have been forced to leave the country. And now the um, arrest of refugees started and so many of these people are uh, facing prosecution if they go back to Afghanistan, especially women who were journalists, um, women's rights um, uh, activists, or human rights defenders. How worried is your office regarding to this matter? And are you talking to the Pakistani government? Do you tell them about the consequences and any developments on your front, um, uh, Human Rights Council, um, regarding to this issue? or? If you can just talk mm. about that a little bit, mm. thank you. Thank you, thank you. That's uh, the similar answer, uh, similar, uh, similar uh, answer as 
for Gaza, uh, the council is the body which consists of uh, the member states. And member states, I'm sure, are following uh, closely what is happening uh, in all parts uh, of the world. And once uh, the council discusses uh, the situation and once the council uh, decides on, s on any actions, then it's up to me maybe to brief you, but uh, there was no specific debate on this particular uh, question as you've, which, we, which you've raised. And if there will be uh, that debate, I'll, I'll uh, comment uh, on that. A part of that, let me stress that it's uh, also uh, applicable to, to Gaza. Uh, the, the UN human rights system is not uh, only uh, created uh, or uh, made of uh, the Human Rights Council. We do have uh, various tools, um, experts, uh, mechanisms. We do have High Commissioner for Human Rights. Uh, and all these elements within the system uh, are working together. So we cannot actually uh, preempt which tool at which, uh, which point of time uh, will be used or shall be used. So. But as, our, as far as the Human Rights Council is concerned, there was no specific debate on this particular question you phrased. And if if uh, the member states would like to discuss uh, that issue, uh, certainly there there is a space uh, even for this. Thank you. I'll take a question online from Abdelhamid Siam. Abdelhamid, you have the floor. Abdelhamid Siam from the Arab Daily Al Qudsil Arabi. I hope my voice is clear. Yes. Yes, we can hear you. We can hear you. Okay. Sir, uh, sir, sir, since you are the president of the Human Rights Council, which is the highest mechanism of the UN that deals with the human right, I want to ask your opinion about what constitute war crimes that the Human Rights Council, this, the Independent Commission for Human Rights, the Human Rights the, uh, the High Commissioner for Human Rights should pay attention to what's going on on Gaza. Can you give us your opinion about what constitutes a war crime, a crime against humanity? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your question. And I'm sure you will understand that uh, there is no actually space for me to uh, really offer you my opinion. I'm here in the capacity of the President of the Council and I do represent the Council uh, here. Uh, so your question is of political nature and uh, my role is the, uh, the role to really express what is the view of the Council as I've mentioned. So uh, if you ask me next year I'll happily uh, answer your question but uh, today uh, there is no point for me actually to express my view uh, on this. Yes. Sir, if you could uh, introduce yourself. Oh, sorry, you have a, you have a follow up question, Abdelhamid? No, no I, I, because every question ha, has been asked about Gaza or what happened in the Middle East, you try not to answer themselves. So I, I really wonder why you're dispelling all these questions. Of the time, I mean, just about less than an hour ago, the hosp Shifa hospital was hit by a missile, killing 15 people on the gate of the hospital and wounding scores of people. And you try to dismiss talking about this. So I don't know if that is the right uh, no, honest, forum uh, or, or, sir, or not. Honestly, I, I take your questions uh, really seriously. I'm not avoiding them, uh, but I'm trying to explain to you that the Council, Human Rights Council, has not yet set the position of the Human Rights Council on this particular situation. So I cannot provide you uh, and explain that position. And th it doesn't matter what is my private opinion. I'm not here in my private capacity. I'm here as the President of the Human Rights Council. Therefore, I'm representing the countries who are members of the Human Rights Council. And I do repeat, since there is no position of the Human Rights Council on this particular situation, I cannot offer an opinion of the President. Thank I you. hope it's clear. Yeah. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. 
almost a month. So uh, I totally understand that uh, it's not personal. You can't give your personal opinion. I totally respect that. But about the Human Rights Council, like what's the formal position, uh, how the council characterized what's happening now in Gaza, it's almost a month. And if there is no position so far, what's hindering a, a formal statement from Human Rights Council about what's happening in Gaza for almost a month now? Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Uh, similar question. Uh, basically, uh, it's not up to the President of the Human Rights Council to set the agenda. Uh, the agenda is being decided uh, by the member states, and if member states decide uh, to really have uh, a debate on specific situation, as I was referring, uh, what was happen happening in the past, we've had a special session on Iran, we've had a special on Sudan, uh, we've had an urgent debate on uh, religious uh, uh, hatred. Uh, then the debate is there. The agenda is set, council is called uh, up in order, and uh, we are debating and we are deciding. And since uh, there is no such a decision, we are not debating and we are not deciding. And uh, it's not a role for any president or for the bureau, uh, bureau to set uh, the agenda, uh, because he cannot manipulate, actually, uh, the, the agenda in this way and to express our op opinions. Uh, and honestly, I'm in my capacity not even representing uh, my country because, as you know, uh, the president of the council is the, the, the only uh, ambassador who is released from his national duties uh, throughout, throughout the year, as far as the Human Rights Council is concerned. Uh, Abdel Hamid, did you have another question? No. Uh, I, no, I, I, I found that it's, this is press conference was, was disappointment, at least for me. I'm sorry, this is my personal view. It's happening in Gaza, and we can't ask about this, and we cannot get answer. And there is a, a, an independent commission that has been established by the council, and it's been investigated. And they spoke here in this room about it. And Navi Pil they spoke to us, and she spoke about the war crime, possible, possible war crimes. And, in, and they are investigating what's happening. And, and here we get no answer. So, I mean, yeah. But, sir, please, please, I, I do apologize that you are not uh, satisfied with my answers. Uh, but, uh, again, I'm here in the capacity of the president of the council. I'm representing the council. Uh, you referred uh, to the independent commission. Independent commission is independent. Uh, it's their view. Uh, my views are dependent. They are dependent on the views of the council. That's the difference. Yes, Margaret? If I could just ask one follow-up. Um, the Human Rights Council is one of the most criticized bodies in the United Nations. And uh, I just wonder what your response is to critics who say that there are too many human rights abusers as members of the council, uh, that you focus on Israel too much, that you're biased, the council members are biased, and so on. Uh, what's your answer to the critics mm. of the Human Rights mm. Council? Mm. I'm aware. I'm maybe on the, uh, the hot ground here in uh, New York. And from New York's perspective, uh, there might be some criticism uh, as far as the Human Rights Council is concerned. But if you are in Geneva, uh, you have a totally different opinion. Uh, Human Rights Council is really a functioning body uh, which is able to deliver, which is able actually to seek for uh, consensus. And uh, I referred uh, to it uh, at the beginning. We are still able to deliver uh, 74 uh, for percent of our decisions by consensus. So I don't see that the criticism is really uh, relevant or adequate uh, to the to the work uh, of the council. Uh, and of course, you can have different opinions. I do respect all the opinions, but uh, those are the arguments I would, I would provide uh, to you. I've said that I, I'm, I'm a really proud uh, president of the Human Rights Council because though we've had really, really difficult uh, debates. Uh, we also faced difficult uh, atmosphere in the Council. We were always, up to now, able to decide, agree or disagree, uh, but uh, really uh, go further and uh, really address uh, the issues which are uh, important for all of us. And uh, again, if you, if you 
take in a, into an account just a simple fact that the countries are still striving to get elected to the council means basically that they do see the, counter, uh, the, the council as the relevant body because you wouldn't actually uh, run your election campaign actually to get elected into the irrelevant uh, body. As a matter of fact, it's such a logical, easy argument. So if you again looked at the list of countries who are running uh, to get the members of the council for the next year, I think uh, the, the answer is clear. It's relevant. It's relevant even for important countries. Do you Rel think it I'm not saying that any country is uh, unimportant. Don't take me wrongly. Do you think the council needs any sort of internal reform? Uh, I, would not, I wouldn't focus only on uh, the Human Rights Council. We need to maybe think about uh, what kind of uh, institutions uh, we are having uh, right now at our disposal, uh, when those institutions were created, and to what extent they, they are uh, really able uh, to react adequately and quickly enough uh, to the today's challenges. But it's not uh, just a question which uh, is relevant uh, for the Human Rights Council. The Human Rights Council, in my view, mm -hmm. is one of the most efficient bodies uh, in the UN system, as a matter of fact. You don't have to agree with me, but uh, this is my sincere belief, because I've, I've run the Council throughout the last year, and I saw the results. I know how many uh, decisions we were able to make, uh, how many debates we've had, and how many issues we were able to address and even uh, introduce new elements uh, into the uh, human rights uh, agenda. Maybe I sound a bit naive, but I really sincerely believe uh, that this is the case. Do we have more questions? Uh, Ambassador Balek, maybe if you have any re concluding remarks. Thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you for being nice uh, on me. Uh, I really uh, do appreciate your openness and curiosity. I would uh, only uh, invite you to Geneva, uh, because the atmosphere in Geneva is slightly different in uh, New York. Maybe uh, during maybe uh, during the less uh, emotional uh, period of time. Uh, but, uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Balek. And as the President said, the work of the Council this year is not yet over. On Monday, the Council will start the review, the Universal Periodic Review of 14 countries, Turkmenistan, Burkina Faso, Cabo Verde, Colombia, Uzbekistan, Tuvalu, Germany, Djibouti, Canada, Bangladesh, the Russian Federation, Azerbaijan, Cameroon, and Cuba. And on the 18th of December, the Human Rights Council will hear from the High Commissioner on Human Rights on the situations in Ukraine and Nicaragua. So thank you very much. I would, I would only add that in the meantime, on 23 and 24th uh, November, we, have, we will have uh, an informal session of the Council in uh, my capital, uh, in Prague, and uh, we will try to address uh, some of those uh, important issues we are uh, seeing flying in the air, uh, also in, a, in this uh, informal setting and informal atmosphere, and we will try, hopefully, uh, to uh, seize the opportunity uh, and contribute uh, to the debates about the efficiency and future of the of the multilateral system as well. Thank you. Thank you. Focusing on waste and suffering and prevent further escalation. In the last few days, uh, Mr. Venislam met with President Herzog, Senior Ministry of Defense, and Israeli defense officials, as well as U.S. and EU envoys, among others. Uh, back here this morning, the Emergency Relief Coordinator, Martin Griffiths, brief member states on the uh, humanitarian situation um, in Gaza. He talked about the despair he saw as he spoke to families of um, uh, families um, of Israeli hostages and families in Gaza who have lost loved ones and their homes. Mr. Griffiths said, we have, see we have seen un 
unfold in Israel and in the occupied Palestinian territory over the last 26 days is nothing short of a blight on our collective conscience. He said there are intense humanitarian negotiations involving Israel, Egypt, the United States, and the UN, with more than 300 trucks having moved into Gaza as of yesterday. More than 100 trucks moved uh, into Gaza yesterday alone, he added, yet that remains far less than the 500 truckloads of goods that moved into Gaza every day prior to the current crisis. Mr. Griffiths called once more on the immediate release of all hostages and stressed the need to keep civilian infrastructure safe from harm, and he reiterated our call for humanitarian pauses. Lynn Hastings, the resident and humanitarian coordinator uh, in the occupied Palestinian territory, also briefed but by video conference. She said the humanitarian impact uh, of the attacks in Gaza have been catastrophic, with more than 9,000 people have been killed in Gaza, and that's according to the Ministry of Health there. Thomas White from the UN Relief and Works Agency, UNRWA, uh, briefed from Rafa. And he discussed the worsening situation as fuel is running out, noting that we could soon have a situation where raw sewage gushes out into Gaza streets. He paid tribute to the work of UNRWA staff for doing in very dangerous condition. And sadly, just to recall, 72 staff from UNRWA have been uh, killed so far uh, to date. Excuse me. Um, still on the occupied Palestinian territory, the Office of the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs says, we, along with our partners, will release a flash update on Monday uh, covering the remainder of the year. The $1.2 billion appeal aims to support 2.7 million people, that's the entire Gaza population, and half a million people in the West Bank. The original appeal that was launched on October 12th asked for $294 million to support 1.3 million people. The situation has grown increasingly desperate since then. The revised flash appeal will outline the need of for food, water, health care, shelter, hygiene, and other urgent priorities following the massive bombardments in Gaza. Uh, update on another crisis we're following uh, closely, which is our peacekeeping mission in Mali. Uh, the convoy we've been updating uh, you uh, on, uh, which is traveling from Kidal to Gao, uh, again suffered an attack. Um, this is part of the withdrawal process. Earlier today, the convoy hit another improvised explosive device about three kilometers northeast of Anifis village in the Kidal region. Seven peacekeepers have been injured and are being medically evacuated. Yesterday, as you'll recall, eight other peacekeepers uh, were injured in similar incidents. They are now reported to be in stable condition. This is the fourth time that the convoy has been impacted by an IED since it left the UN base in Kidal on the 31st of October. Um, and a quick update for you from Sudan, uh, which as you know is another major, major humanitarian uh, crisis. Um, an update on our efforts to deliver life-saving assistance. Our colleagues at OCHA says they facilitated an eight-truck convoy of food and medical supplies to South Kordofan's capital, Kadiguli, uh, the first since the intense fighting broke out in April. This is a positive development, but we, of course, need sustained access to continue delivering to people in need across the country. However, the si situation remains extremely distressing, specifically in Darfur, and especially for women and girls. The UN Human Rights Office says they're deeply alarmed by reports they've received of women and girls being abducted and held in in inhuman, degrading, and slave-like conditions in areas controlled by the rapid support forces in Darfur, where they are allegedly forcibly married and held for ransom. Credible information from survivors, witnesses, and other sources suggest that more than 20 women and girls have been taken, but the number could be higher. The UN Human Rights Office restated uh, the High Commissioner's call on senior officials of both the Sudanese Armed Forces and the Rapid Support Forces, as well as any other armed groups affiliated with them, to unequivocally condemn these vile acts and issue urgently clear instructions to their subordinates demanding zero tolerance for sexual violence. They must also ensure the abducted women and girls are promptly released and provided with the necessary support, including medical and psychosocial care, that all alleged cases are fully and promptly investigated with those found responsible, held accountable, and brought to justice. 
Turning to the Democratic Republic of the Congo, our humanitarian colleagues tell us that in October alone, last month, more than 300,000 men, women, and children were driven from their homes by escalating violence in North Kivu province in the eastern part of the Congo. This brings the total number of people displaced in the eastern part of the country to more than 6 million people. The eastern provinces are also facing continued outbreaks of cholera and measles. Despite the volatile situation, we, along with our partners, have reached some 3 million people with humanitarian aid, including 1.9 million with food assistance in the region. However, as we've said on several occasions, um, access remains very much of a challenge due to the recent and ongoing violence in Beni. Um, this has forced many humanitarian workers to temporarily suspend their operations, leaving more than 140,000 people unable to receive assistance. This year's $2.3 billion humanitarian uh, response plan is only 36% funded. We need more money. Turning to Ukraine, um, I can tell you that we strongly condemn the latest wave of Russian attacks against critical infrastructure in various parts of the country, which reportedly resulted in injuries among the civilian population, including children, and caused damage to civilian, residential, and commercial buildings. We are concerned about the escalation of such incidents and their impact on the lives of civilians, especially at the onset of the winter period. We reiterate in the clearest terms that attacks against civilian and civilian infrastructure excuse me, are prohibited under international humanitarian law and they must stop immediately. Also, just on a humanitarian update from Ukraine, um, our colleagues there tell us that the attacks this week have destroyed energy facilities, schools, hospitals, and other public sites. The Kherson region in the south and Donetsk region in the east were particularly affected. Kharkiv City was also attacked last night. Our partner NGOs are already on site, providing psychological support and shelter material to people whose homes were damaged in the attacks. We and our partners continue to provide critical aid to frontline communities. Today, an interagency humanitarian convoy delivery uh, delivered vital aid to about 1,600 people who remain on the frontline towns of Kharkiv in the Japaritsa region. The aid includes medicine, household hygiene kits, as well as blankets, mattresses, solar lamps, sleeping bags, and food aid is also continuing to be distributed. This year alone, we and our partners have delivered 14 convoys to frontline communities in Japaritsa region, providing essential support to more than 30,000 people living in near the southern front. There have been 96 humanitarian convoys to frontline areas since the beginning of this year. Ahead of winter, humanitarian workers are distributing vital items such as thermal blankets, mattresses, and portable heaters. We and our partners are also appealing for $435 million to deliver winter assistance to more than 1.7 million people across Ukraine through March of 2024, which obviously covers the winter. A couple of travel announcements for you. Um, Tomorrow, our Deputy Secretary General Mina Mohammed will be heading to the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, where she will participate in the opening ceremony of the inaugural International Conference on Women in Islam. This is organized by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the Organization of Islamic Cooperation in Jeddah. The conference aims to facilitate dialogue about the position of women in Islam, encompassing both religion and cultural aspects and promoting Muslims' women's rights. Um, during her visit, she will meet with senior government officials from the Islamic Development Bank and other stakeholders. She'll be back in New York on the 7th, on Tuesday. Jean-Pierre Lacroix, our head of peace operations, is wrapping up his three-day visit to Cyprus today. He had discussions with leaders of both sides of the island regarding recent developments within the buffer zone and the work of the UN peacekeeping force to maintain stability on the island. He also engaged with civil society representatives, including women and youth representatives. Uh, he also went to the Pila Peel Plateau and stressed that the implementation of the understanding that was reached recently is essential. In addition, he visited the Committee on Missing Persons and met with uh, some of its members. Um, Assistant Secretary General for Humanitarian Affairs Joyce Misuya is in Mozambique, where she visited the northern province of Cabo Delgado yesterday and today. We, along with our partners, are continuing to provide life-saving assistance to people impacted by the conflict there. Ms. Misuya met with women and children and men who have returned to the district of Mosimboe da Praia after fleeing violence that started in 2017. 
Nearly three-quarters of the 175,000 returnees in the districts reside in areas where basic infrastructure, such as school, health centers, and water facilities, have yet to be restored. A reminder that more than two million people in Mozambique need humanitarian assistance to cope with the impact of the conflict, climate change, extreme weather events, including Cyclone Freddy uh, earlier this year. We and our partners have reached now some 1.5 million people in the country with some form of humanitarian assistance in the first part of this year. To do more, we need more funding. In 2023, humanitarian appeal for Mozambique for $513 million is just over one-third funded. Our response plan for Cyclone Freddy, floods, and cholera is even less resourced, having received over just 16% of the $138 million that we need. Uh, food price index, our friends at FAO report today that the international food commodity prices have declined moderately in October, down 0.5% from September, with the index for dairy products the only one to see a bit of rise. According to the latest crop prospects and food situation report also published today, FAO says persisting and intensifying conflict are aggravating food insecurity, moderating international food commodity prices, and are being countered, are being countered by weak currency in many low-income country. Sunday is which day, besides being Sunday? Marathon. It, it is a marathon. I will not be running, I hate to tell you. Um, it is World Tsunami Awareness Day. In his message, the Secretary General says, early warning for all initiative, which aims to protect every person on Earth by 2027, prioritizes the needs of the most vulnerable. It requires an investment of $3.1 billion about 50 cents for each person to be covered, which is small price to pay to protect people. Monday, we will be joined virtually from Paris by Guilherme Canela de Souza Godoy, UNESCO's Head of Freedom of Expression and Safety of Journalists. And just want to flag to also on Sunday, the UN Office of Drugs and Crime, in coordination with the UN Assistance Mission in Afghanistan, will launch its 2023 Afghan Opium Survey, always an interesting document. The survey examines the latest findings and emerging trends of the illicit opium trade and economy. Uh, it will be the second report since the de facto authorities banned the cultivation of opium poppy and all narcotics in April of last year. The 2022 harvest was largely exempted from the decree, meaning this survey is the first to examine trends since the enforcement of the ban. Uh, I think the advanced copies have been shared with you. Maggie, then Edie. A lot of bad news for a Friday stuff, yeah. <laughs> a lot. <laughs> um, and there's more. After meeting with Secretary of State Blinken, Prime Minister Netanyahu said there would be no humanitarian pauses until the hostages are released. How is this going to impact the UN's work? Well, it's, uh, we will continue, we've seen the, the statements, we will obviously continue uh, to, um, to push uh, for humanitarian goods to get in. I mean, I, I don't, we, couldn't be any clearer as to what the humanitarian situation in Gaza is um, and the need for more aid to come in. Edie. This time Maggie beat me to that <laughs> the exact same question. Yeah. But also, can you tell us um, what the Secretary General is uh, going to um, do now? Is he planning any future travels? Who's he been talking to? Uh, the travels, uh, the travels will, uh, I mean, I've no, let me put it this way, I have no travel to announce uh, in the immediate. Uh, I think we, he will be here uh, next week. Uh, we also have his uh, annual uh, meeting of the Chief Executive Board. Uh, which will happen next week, which will be formally announced a little later, uh, which will be an occasion for him also to have a very focused uh, discussion, not only on the years ahead, but on the situation, uh, especially the humanitarian situation uh, now. And he remains, I, I'm not going to go into the details of his calls, but he remains in contact with a number of people. Is the Chief Executive's board meeting going to be here in New York? It will be in New York. Yeah, the fall session is always here in New York. Deji. They asked some parts of my question, actually. I, I don't okay. complain to me but, about who's asking yeah, questions. Yeah. Yeah, everybody's talking about the, the humanitarian pauses. Um, but as far as I remember, the Secretary General is actu actually asking for humanitarian ceasefire, which is, which is to some degree actually different from the, the humanitarian pauses which led to the hostages. So 
what what does the Secretary General's idea on this this pauses for releasing the hostages? Do you think no, that I, would first contribute all, to let, a let's, I think the Secretary fire? General has been very clear is that all the things he's been talking about, which is you know. Uh, uh, halt in the fighting to get uh, humanitarian aid, the release of, of, of hostages uh, immediately, unconditionally, are not, should not be linked and they should not be used as bargaining chips. So, since we have already talked about hostages, is there any update on the negotiations of Nothing releasing to share the with hostages? Nothing to share what about this, the situation in the border area between Lebanon and Israel? Do you, do you have any? I mean, we're just, we're, we're uh, they're being Again, there have been an exchange of uh, a yeah. fire across the blue line uh, today. Uh, we will reiterate uh, our, our, our message to avoid any sort of further escalation in what is already a very tense area. Amélie, then, uh, Sylvia. Thanks, Steph. On, on Mali, um, it's been, uh, I mean, they, they, the, the convoy has been hit almost every day by an IED. So w what is uh, MINUSMA, um, I mean, do they believe that the convoy is specifically targeted on its way to Gao, or it is just that the, the road is, is, is... It's hard, I mean... Let me put it this way. I think it's hard to uh, it, it's it's hard to tell, right? Um, I, I don't. I've not seen any reports where they have seen people leave IDs. Whether or not these are IDs that have been there for a long time, whether people know that the convoy is coming this way, because frankly, there aren't uh, a thousand ways to get from Kidal to Gao uh, when you're dealing with that many trucks. So uh, the 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 road, it's clear what road they will use. Uh, we can only speak to the impact that it's having, uh, which is a continuous threat uh, to our peacekeeping colleagues. Just a, a follow-up. Considering uh, some previous convoy were uh, driving really, really slow, like one or two kilometers an hour, uh, how many more days will they take for them to reach Gao? And so uh, how many more days are going to be I at risk my, of I think my sense is there's about four, it was about four days worth of, uh, of travel. So hopefully they will arrive sometime this weekend. And it's clear that, uh, it's clear that every time there's such an attack, it delays the convoy. Uh, further. Uh, Sylviane, Don, and then Caitlin. Thank you, Stefan. And on the south of Lebanon, uh, the Unifil is caught now in the heart of the tension between Lebanon and Israel. Is there any plan for uh, the Secretary General or for Mr. Lacroix the, to, to go to Lebanon and visit Unifil? Uh, I will. I, if I have any travel to announce, I don't think there's any plan for the Secretary General in the immediate term. Uh, for Mr. Lacroix, I will uh, will keep you. Uh, we will keep you posted. There is uh, another. The 1701 will be the new report will be uh, discussed on uh, November 22nd. Is there a new? Uh, can we have some more uh, information about uh, the Unifil? Uh, well, I mean, we engagement. All, we are there new? There are there new? Engagement rules for during new this engagement war? rules. Yeah. No, not no, there's no. There are no new rules of engagement as far as as far as I know. Okay. okay. Uh, Dawn, then Caitlin, and then I'll, go, I'll get to the rest. Thanks, Steph. I have two questions: one on Syria and one on Gaza. Um, for Syria, the su there was a suicide drone attack in Homs on October fifth. Um, but since then, the Syrian regime hasn't let up on its attacks in northwest Syria. And while I can't speak for Syrians, when I go on social media, a lot of Syrians that I follow say that they feel forgotten by the world. Um, so I wanted to know what would be the Secretary General's message to the people in northwest Syria who are still suffering. And then my second question is has to do with... Um, the Secretary General's level of confidence in the crop of world leaders that we have today and their ability to deal with the situations that we have in Gaza and Ukraine, does he believe that these people, and I mean, you could think about like the P5 of this uh, Security Council, are they up to the task? Do they have what it takes to deal with what 
what's happening in the world today. Thanks. <laughs> Why? <laughs> Uh, I, I, listen, I, no, 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 that's, that's not, it's not the answer. The answer is that we, they, they have no choice. We have no choice. We all have to be up uh, to the task. Uh, you know, the, while there may be uh, not as much political progress as we would like uh, on, on the Syria track, uh, as outlined in, in what is called for by uh, the Security Council resolution, the United Nations, in embodied by the humanitarian staff uh, that remains in Syria, has not forgotten the Syrian people, has not abandoned the Syrian people. Uh, we continue to deliver aid uh, in whichever way we can, whether that's cross line or, or, or cross border, and we continue to be there um, with the Syrian people. And I think as we have from this podium quite often, uh, express not only express our concern but condemn the violence civilians are subjected to on a regular basis in many many parts of the country uh, can I just follow up yeah. really quick on the Baba Hawa crossing I believe that that renewal is coming up but it's a secret renewal yeah let me find, understanding uh, let, so let me see if I can find answer to that secret uh, Caitlin Sarifi and then Pam um, thank you. Uh, does the UN have any comment or um, was it aware of this ambulance convoy that was reportedly struck by Israeli fire uh, in Gaza as it was heading towards Rafah? No, I haven't seen anything from here, but I will, uh, I will check. Also on Gaza, um, do you have any updated numbers on how many uh, UN staffers have been able to leave Gaza through the Rafah crossing for nationals and have they been replaced? No, there is a rotation. Uh, it's, a small, uh, it's a small number. Uh, I think it's about less than 10 of ro the rotation, uh, but that is, on, that is ongoing. <coughs> been replaced? So, yes, some have been replaced, yep. Uh, Pam. Uh, oh, sorry, and that's Siri. I, I apologize. Separate question, but just as a follow up to this question, total number of UNRWA in Gaza now, about 1,000, I thought you said? Uh, no, I've always said about 13,000 UN staff. 13,000 yes, still that, in Gaza. Well, I mean, they, they, they are, the vast, vast majority of them are, are Palestinians who live and work in Gaza. Okay, and only 10 or so have. Uh, but those are internationals, out. and they're not, uh, they're from different agencies. Uh, that are also you that operate in Gaza. Okay, now my question, <laughs> which is um, just turning to Ukraine. Uh, there's there have been some announcements by Ukraine that a that a Black Sea corridor is still working a little bit. What's the status? Is the JCC in Istanbul still there? I mean, there's I mean, still the structure is still there, and our efforts to to revive. Uh, the grain deal and fully implement the MOU are also continuing. All right, thank you. Sirifi, you've been very patient, thank you. No problem at all, thank you, Steph. So the hospitals in Gaza are continuing to be a target uh, despite all calls by the United Nations. And there are reports and images that Israel has targeted the vicinity of three hospitals uh, today, Al Shifa, Al Quds, and the Indonesian hospital. I want to ask, is the UN working on a plan, an initiative to enforce international law and stop Israel from targeting health facilities, basically? Well, first of all, we, we, uh, uh, we continue uh, to call for the full respect of international law, which in includes the, the, the point that hospitals should not be used in any part of, of combat. Um, but. You know, like in any conflict, uh, and we talk, I mean, just today we, we've spoken about, you know, what's going on in Gaza, we've spoken about what's the, the horrific stories from, uh, from Sudan, we've spoken about Ukraine. Um, we keep calling for the respect of international humanitarian law, but in none of these cases is the UN the one with the fingers on the trigger, right? So I, I think that hopefully answers your question. Deji. Sorry, and I just got this news. Um, if Russian you just got it, I didn't get it. The Russian foreign minister said that um, the foreign minister of, of Russia, Lavrov, has already sent a letter to the Secretary General on deratifying the nuclear test ban treaty. Uh, does the Secretary General receive that letter? And what message does the Secretary General have for 
both Russia and the I, I don't know if the actual letter has been received, but we've obviously seen uh, the news, uh, which the Secretary General deeply uh, regrets, and he deeply regrets Russia's revocation of the uh, ratification of the CTBT. Uh, he's consistently stressed the need for entry into force of the treaty, which is, uh, you know, one of the main, main pillars of the global disarmament and non-proliferation architecture. Um, he strongly urges all states that have not yet ratified uh, the CB CTBT to do so without reservation or condition, especially those whose ratification is required for the treaty's entry into force. In the interim, he calls on all nuclear weapon states to publicly reaffirm their moratorium against nuclear testing and their commitment to the treaty. Celia. Steph, in the state of um, the world right now, do you think it's wise for the Security Council members to go on a retreat trip? I, 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 uh, I have, that first of all, I have, I have no, uh, we have no authority on what the Security Council does. I fully, we fully, um, believe that uh, Security Council members can do more than one thing at the same time. And frankly, uh, perhaps um, meeting in a retreat and meeting off-site can only can have positive developments. Do you really believe so? Well, if I didn't believe it, I wouldn't say it. I tend to believe what I say. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, thank you. Eric Peters with uh, Kyoto News. Thanks, Stefan. Uh, I was wondering if, uh, so the IDF spokesperson announced that uh, they had encircled Gaza City, uh, or, mm -hmm. and uh, I was wondering if uh, aid can still get in? No, I mean, we've, we've been, uh, it's been very difficult for us uh, to access the northern part of, uh, of Gaza, and as we've said, we're not able to deliver the humanitarian services we need to do that in those areas. So nothing can reach Gaza City right now? That's, that's my understanding from UNRWA is they've not been able to deliver the humanitarian aid they need to uh, to the areas in the north. Thank you. Yes, sir. So you uh, the microphone. Okay, finally I got it. Thank you for doing this briefing on a daily basis. We've heard so many characterization for what's happening in Gaza. War crimes, genocide, a blight. How does the General Secretary characterize it officially and formally. Well, uh, he read Thank what you. he's been saying. Read what we've been saying. I mean, we've been characterizing using different words uh, since the be beginning. But I, I mean, his. I think his characterizations are reflected in his in his very public remarks, whether to the press or whether to the Security Council. Uh, Tony. Thank you, Steph. So uh, I remember at the very beginning of this briefing, you started with the uh, Secretary General contacts and Torun Sled, what mm -hmm. they are doing and uh, working with uh, different parties, but that wasn't enough information for us. Can you, are you able to share more about this like, very specific part of the UN role in this crisis? I mean, our, our, you know, our role is, I would say, is, is multi-pronged. Uh, we are continuing to speak to key interlocutors, obviously. Uh, Who are they? Pa 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 Palestinian uh, interlocutors, Israeli interlocutors, uh, Qataris, Americans, Egyptians, and others. There are a lot of different um, member states and entities that uh, hold partially hold the key to solving uh, and stopping what is uh, what what is going on uh, I we do not um, we share as much as we feel comfortable sharing so as not to endanger uh, the the policies that I mean the the, the issues we're trying to move uh, forward uh, let me go to the screen to those who haven't had a chance uh, and then I'll come back uh, Abdel Hamid. Uh, thank you, Stefan. I have a couple of questions. I hope, I hope you, you will be patient with me. First, uh, the question about uh, targeting the hospitals uh, it has been asked, so I won't repeat that. Uh, the, in the West Bank, uh, Stefan,
Uh, we've lost you, uh, Abdel Hamid. Palestinians were killed. Uh, Israeli stormed into this. And yet the UN, uh, we have not heard any word about what's going on in the West Bank in the last few days, especially about this, what happened in Jenin this today. I, leaving I, I, Abdel killed. Hamid, I, I think, and, you know, I, I think it's, it's um, I would encourage you to really look at the transcripts of, of past briefings, because we have spoken about what the violence in the West Bank. We have condemned the violence by uh, the settlers. We have underscored Israel's responsibilities to ensure the safety of all people uh, living in, in the West Bank. So we have spoken about that, and we continue to, to do so. What is your next question, sir? My next question on October, on October 30th, Mr. Thor Winsland had the time to go visit two Israeli settler, settlement inside Kfar, Alza, and Beiri. And he sat with the families of uh, what he said suffered appalling acts of terror by Hamas against uh, in women, children, and whole family. That was his, his words. I've been asking you, Stefan, for many times, why he never visited a Palestinian family? Why he didn't visit those towns that were destroyed by the settlers, including Hawara? I think, uh, I think Mr. Ms. Whether, uh, Ms. Mr. Mr. Venislan, Mr. Venislan has uh, has also uh, spoken to Palestinian families. Uh, I would remind you that Martin Griffiths was also there. Uh, he met with families of um, uh, Israeli hostages. He also spoke uh, to families in, in, in Gaza. Uh, so I, I, I don't agree with your characterization. If you have a third question, go ahead. Otherwise, I'll just move on. One, just you give me one example that he visited a family. From I, I, I do not have his January personal 1st, agenda. I do not have his personal agenda with me, but I can assure you uh, that it's whether it's Mr. Venislan, his his colleagues. Uh, I mean, we are um, we, we are we try okay. to be there with people who have suffered and who continue to suffer. OK, uh, let's That's go. My last question. Yep. My last question. Mr. Hassan Nasrallah gave a long speech today, uh, the head of Hezbollah. First, uh, did the UN uh, follow that speech? Uh, in, yes, in we, which we, he we said we, that he considered himself a part of the what's going on, and he said he will escalate. Depends on Israel. If Israel escalates, he would increase also his involvement. Do you have any comment we're, on this? We're fully aware of the speech delivered by Mr. Nasrallah, uh, which oh, obviously, like many others, were watching. I'm not going to go into an analysis or comment of everything that he said. I would just reiterate our, our comment and, and what we've said earlier today and what we've been saying is uh, the need to for all those uh, who have the power to do so to avoid any sort of escalation uh, along the, the blue line and to avoid uh, and to cease all hostile acti uh, activities uh, across the blue line and um, as well as escalatory rhetoric. Um, Maggie. Two follow-ups, Steph. You mentioned on Monday that uh, OCHA will increase the appeal for Gaza to 1.2 billion. Can we yes, expect a donors conference to I do that? I don't think, uh, I, we asked this morning, I don't think there will be an actual event, but it will be a release. But we hope that even without a conference, donors will donate. Okay, and second, um, Okay, so much is made of language at the UN and diplomatic language. So the Secretary General has been calling repeatedly for humanitarian ceasefire. Mm -hmm. Today, uh, Mr. Griffiths called it a humanitarian pause. You repeated that at the podium, pause. The Americans have been saying no to a ceasefire, okay to a pause. Is, that a ref is your change in language a reflection of that because you don't think you can get better uh, than a pause? Uh, can you explain why? I think we, will, we, we are trying to get as much as we can, and I will leave it at that. So you uh, think that's all that's realistic? I, I will leave it at that. Uh, Edie, that's her. <laughs> yeah, and then um, Going back to Mali, as I recall, one of the big issues was <clears throat> that the uh, 
authorities in Mali would not allow any um, aerial cover for the convoy. Is that still yeah. the I case? Mean, we've, had, we've had a lot of challenges getting clearance uh, for flights. We had some medevac flights, uh, but we're not operating as many flights as we, we should be able to operate in order to up the safety of our uh, peacekeepers who are moving on the ground. And is there any estimate of how 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 many more days it's going to take? We we hope to, they get to uh, Gao by the weekend, the end of the weekend. Uh, Serfin and then Don. Thank you again, Steph. Just took me a minute to process what you said. Obviously, the UN is not the one with the trigger on its hand, but I'm not asking this to undermine the United Nations, not no, at I'm, all. I'm not taking but I just, this. Uh, yeah, I just yeah. want to really know what can the UN do besides calling, uh, you know, to stop the hostilities or condemning the brutalities, because I think there's a huge expectation from the UN, not well, just I from mean, people I, on the ground, I, I, but I think, from all around you know, the world. I think the question is which UN you're talking about, right? I can only speak for a s part of that, and that's the Secretary General. The Secretary General, his, his authority, in a sense, is in his, his voice and the voice of his uh, officials, and we continue to call on this and continue to push it publicly and continue to push it uh, privately. There are other parts, legislative parts in the UN, that could be doing more to, see, uh, to ensure an end to this conflict. Uh, Don. Thanks, Steph. Um, in recent days, the US Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, has been talking about this idea of the day after in Gaza. And um, it's just very strange to think of the day after as if you snap your fingers, it's the day after. And I understand that the two-state solution is politically popular. I don't know if that's too far of a stretch to say. I know the Secretary General um, supports it. But what we're dealing with here is two groups of people, Palestinians and Israelis, who've been traumatized. Mm -hmm. I'm not here to judge who more than yeah. the other. There's a lot of psychological a lot of psychological tension there with a two-state solution how I mean what is what can be done to bring these people how are you going to ask these people to now live together in two states when we're talking about generations of trauma this you know when entity Blinken talks about the day after it's like whoa 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 we're talking about generations of trauma right I mean there will be a need for a day after there will be a need for reconciliation. There will be a need to address um, the violence. There'll be a need to address um, the trauma. And I think the international community should work in unison um, to ensure, uh, ensure that goal. On that word, I've scored my last goal. And I'm. Oh, sorry. That I thought Just, I, I was hoping that was a joke, but no. Go ahead, Caitlin. Yeah, yeah. Uh, can we get the Secretary General to do a briefing if he's going to be here all week? Yeah. I, I'm gonna, no, yeah. no, no I've, I, yes, it's on my, it's on my to-do list. You are. show has been produced by Depictions Media. Please contact us at depictions.media for more information.